The revolution of Blair Mountain was a reaction to the collapsing coal industry and the brutality of the coal companies. It ultimately culminated in the deunionization of West Virginia and severely detrimental reforms within the UMWA, which would cripple the union for the rest of the decade. World War I ushered in an increased demand for coal. Coal production rose from 111 million tons in 1890 to 579 million tons by 1918. During the war, the total number of employed miners rose from 561,000 to 615,000. However, this growth was not to last. The demand for coal at the end of the war dropped nearly 60% with the loss of munitions markets in Europe. Competition from alternate fuel sources and the improved utilization of coal due to new technologies further harmed the industry. This was in stark contrast to the norm during the Roaring Twenties with the majority of industries experiencing growth. Burdened with a massive surplus, the coal companies began to cut wages, reducing the minimal gains negotiated by the United Mine Workers of America at the end of World War I. This further aggravated tensions between the miners and the operators. The roots of this revolution, in addition to the collapsing coal industry, lay in the brutal tyranny of the coal companies who used any means necessary to suppress the miners. One of the most important methods utilized was the payment of miners in scrip, a monetary system only accepted at the company-owned store. By forcing the miners to buy from them, the companies were able to manipulate prices as they pleased, almost always forcing the miners into debt. The operators' tactics were not limited to scrip. The owners also used their own private security force to prevent unionization, instituted a bureaucratic form of rape known as ESAW, planted spies to root out union miners, and even constructed their own company courthouses. Everything the operators did, right down to the design of the company store, was meant to keep the miners in check. And as John L. Lewis of the UMWA so aptly puts it, Arrogant and insolent gentlemen do not hesitate to suborn public officials in their communities, to police their communities with privately hired and armed gunmen, to evict our people from their homes, to cut off food supplies for our people and leave them to their mercy, to cut off water and electric light, and to cut off medical attention. And apparently, we have plenty of aid to give stricken peoples anywhere in the world except in the mining regions of this country. May 19, 1920, 13 Baldwin Feltz detectives arrived in the town of Matewan in Mingo County along the Kentucky-West Virginia border. The Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency regularly supplied the mine operators with men who served as mine guards, rapists, and all-around hired thugs, much like their Pinkerton doubles to the north. These particular agents were here to serve eviction notices. After illegally evicting the miners from their homes on the edge of town, the agents returned to the train station, where Sid Hatfield, the chief of police, and the mayor of Matewan, Cable Testament confronted the agents. When Hatfield attempted to make a lawful arrest, the agents opened fire. Deputies and citizens responded, and in the ensuing chaos, ten people were killed, seven felt agents, and three citizens. Many West Virginia newspapers closely followed the trial of the shootout, and in the months following, Sid Hatfield became the embodiment of the Union struggle, gaining respect and fame among the miners. In July of 1921, Sid Hatfield was charged with blowing up a coal tipple in Mohawk. His court appearance was set for the 1st of August in McDowell County. Awaiting his arrival at the McDowell County Courthouse were three Baldwin Feltz agents. Charles E. Lively, a Baldwin Feltz spy, Bill Saltier, a survivor of the Matewan Massacre, and George Pence, whose motto was, shoot him with one gun and hand him another. When Hatfield reached the top of the steps, the three men opened fire, killing Hatfield. The next day, over 2,000 people turned out for Sid's funeral. Miners were angry and some began to arm themselves. District 17 President Frank Keeney, along with Treasurer Ed Mooney, counseled the miners to patience. As the miners began to gather near Charleston in preparation for an armed march into the non-union coal fields, Governor Morgan convinced the federal government to intervene. General Harry H. Bandeholtz was dispatched to Charleston on August 26. There, Bandeholtz met with Governor Morgan, Keeney, and Mooney, and demanded Keeney and Mooney put an end to the uprising. The two, now backed by the federal government, reported having success in convincing the miners to disperse. Thus satisfied, Bandeholtz returned to Washington that same night. It appeared the march was over. However, the coal companies, using Logan County Sheriff Don Chaffin as their medium, would soon deliberately shatter this fragile peace. On August 27, 2.30 a.m., around 90 state troopers under the leadership of one Captain Baracus were sent to the aid of Sheriff Chaffin on orders from Governor Morgan. Augmented by Chaffin's men, the posse increased to about 130. The men then set off for the town of Sharples in Union Territory. When Captain Brockus and his men reached the town of Sharples around 8 p.m. that night, Brockus claims that his force of 130 met with five miners who opened fire. According to Brockus, 
Shooting them became general after that. It should be noted that not one of the 130 deputies was hurt, while the houses of Sharples lay riddled with bullet holes and the five miners lay dead. Outraged, the miners resumed their march with an even greater intensity than before, a result the companies had hoped for, as it would provide legal grounds for the destruction of the UMWA. A later senatorial committee found Chaffin guilty of reinciting the march and said, quote, The descent upon this town at night, to serve these warrants, could hardly have any other effect than to start afresh the threatened trouble. Miners hijacked trains, raided stores for arms and munitions, and by August 29th, the battle was in full swing. Estimates place the number of marching miners at anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 and even beyond. In response, Sheriff Chaffin mustered up a defending force of about 3,000 to 5,000. Although outnumbered, Chaffin's army had the higher ground and better weaponry, including planes armed with homemade bombs and several machine guns. The miners and the defenders engaged in sporadic fighting for four days. Most of the fighting occurred in four locations, Beach Creek, Blair Mountain, Crooked Creek, and Mill Creek. Governor Morgan became increasingly desperate in his pleas for federal support. However, it wasn't until September 2nd that his pleas were answered. Upon the arrival of federal troops, miners assumed the troops would support them. The troops even met with the supposed rebel leader, Bill Blizzard. However, they did not take sides, and with the somewhat grudging help of Blizzard, convinced the miners to lay down their arms. As the strike ended, the coal companies began to pursue their true objective, crushing the Union by any means necessary. The first theater of this new battle took place within the courts, with the companies attempting to abolish the leadership within the Union by accusing 24 prominent UMWA leaders of treason, painting them as communists in a reasonably successful attempt to turn the public against them. The coal companies also attempted to crush the Union financially, filing a lawsuit demanding a million dollars in damages incurred by the Union strike three years earlier in 1919. This and other lawsuits like the 1922 Bill Blizzard treason trial, the cost of which ran at $1,000 to $2,000 per day, were severely taxing on the UMWA treasury. Not to mention the fact that the UMWA was still paying unemployment stipends to three-fourths of the remaining Union members. Further harming the Union fiscally was the fact that in 1925, as the Union began to collapse, Lewis had committed much of the organization's remaining resources into a feudal struggle to retain the northern West Virginia coal fields for the Union. The fact that non-Union mines could meet the demand for soft coal and do so cheaper left Lewis with little to no leverage for negotiating wage gains. This would aggravate tensions between Lewis and more radical UMWA leaders during the 1922 national strike, when Lewis only managed to maintain the present wage rates. As a result, District 17 lost leadership, with Keeney and Mooney being forced out by Lewis as he attempted to consolidate power and force out members who he saw as radical, which was partly caused by the treason trials in West Virginia. This damaged the Union's organizing capability, and when coupled with the financial destruction wrought by numerous lawsuits, caused West Virginia membership to drop from 75,000 to 10,000. A trend repeated on a national scale, with the UMWA losing over 125,000 members by 1927. After removing Keeney and Mooney, Lewis put District 17 on probation and appointed Van Bittner as the district head. However, evidence suggests that Van Bittner was an ineffective organizer due to his air of superiority, and that any gains in membership, especially after the New Deal in the 1930s, were made thanks to District Vice President and later President Bill Blizzard, who after the battle was hailed as a hero by the miners. It's quite possible that the Union would have been broken and disbanded, especially when the Great Depression hit the United States. However, it was prevented thanks to President Roosevelt and the New Deal. The first real gains for the Union came in 1935 with the Lafoyet hearings, the largest investigation into working conditions and workers' rights to date, and the Wagner Act, which outlawed unfair labor practices like discrimination policies against Union workers. The revolution of Blair ultimately resulted in a series of crippling blows which not only damaged District 17, but also the United Mine Workers of America as a whole. Since the reaction of the operators was swift and merciless, destroying the Union's leadership, organizing capability, and decimating the Union's treasury through the courts. The battle ultimately paved the way for negative reforms within the Union, causing power vacuums, further loss of organizing capabilities, and political unrest. Without the protection implemented in the Wagner Act, the revolution of Blair Mountain would have destroyed the Union, the very thing which these miners fought so hard to preserve. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store.